Uh, we're going to now kind of finish up the afternoon and the, the session here uh, with John Petty, who's been sitting here patiently waiting to tell you all about how to manage DVTs and DVT profil or met DVT prophylaxis in our trauma patients. Great. Thanks, Richard. Spoiler alert here, I don't know the answer. So if you want to shop on Amazon while I'm giving my talk on your screens at home, I think that's probably okay. But we will talk about it and at least give a little bit of a shape to our shared ignorance on this. But um, it's a privilege to be able to talk about something that we don't have the data that we'd like to be able to answer the question. And yet, everyone who takes care of children, um, both in the room and uh, joining us remotely, has to answer this question on a pretty much daily basis for the patients they care for. So what do we know? Uh, well, we know that uh, VTE, venous thromboembolism, in pediatric trauma is a rare event. Um, looking at large database uh, sorts of studies, its incidence is somewhere between 0 0.02 and 0.33 percent, so a fraction of 1 percent of all hospitalized trauma patients. That is higher than general uh, hospitalized uh, children. Um, so it's, uh, it's a risk for trauma, but it's not a high risk. We also know that it's a serious event, um, that if it happens, there's about a 2 percent association with mortality and about an 8 percent incidence of recurrence. Um, and then post-phlebitic syndrome, leg swelling, uh, venous stasis, uh, some studies have described 10 to 50 percent incidence of that. So uh, it's a rare event, but if it happens, it's a pretty serious problem. And we also believe this to be a preventable event. That is, the children don't roll into the trauma bay with a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. It's something that uh, happens subsequent to the injury and probably happens when they're in our care. And so there is this opportunity, unlike a lot of things in pediatric trauma, to intervene, do something uh, after the injury but before the uh, complication. And then it's also uh, a, an adult event. Uh, there's a pretty good adult literature about DVT and PE prophylaxis, and that's because their incidence is so much higher. It's a, about a 3 to 5 percent incidence in adult patients. So uh, there's an opportunity there to get better numbers and do better studies and to move the sort of science of it forward in an adult. And, you know, th this makes it harder for th those of us that take care of just children, but it really is something we should be thankful for. We're blessed that our children are not coming down with DVTs and PEs every day. So what do we not know? Uh, well, plenty is the short answer to that. Uh, what we don't know in these big uh, database type studies is what is the use of prophylaxis. So we know the incidence of VTE, but we don't know how those patients are being prophylaxed on the front end uh, because prophylaxis isn't perfect. Uh, we don't know how well it works in children. And, uh, and, and I don't think that this is an area where we can just assume that what we're doing in adults works the same amount in the same way in children. Uh, these big database type studies don't capture how the VTE uh, was diagnosed. So patients who are screened for it with uh, ultrasound, uh, you may find a lot of DVTs if you look real hard, uh, but are those consequential in terms of uh, how the patient uh, recovers or uh, complications from it? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, so screening practice may, may be different and that would affect your incidence as well. And then it's already been mentioned related to pancreatic injuries. What's the long-term outcome for these children as they grow up to adulthood? Is it better because they have better plasticity to their vascular system, or is it worse because whatever misery they've signed up for in childhood is multiplied all over the rest of the years of their life? We don't really have good data on that. So we're left with this, balancing uh, benefit and risk. What's the benefit of uh, prophylaxis? Well, you're trying to prevent PE and DVT, post syndrome. syndrome. Uh, there's also a quality component to this. Uh, uh, whether we like it or not, children's hospitals are being measured by how well they do with this question, even though it is not a purely pediatric question. It's something that we're being benchmarked and measured in public reporting and all that. There are quality collaboratives that are pushing this to those of us who take care of children, too, and probably for the best, but ready or not, here it comes. Um, and then the cost. There was a recent paper published in Pediatrics that looked at the cost of a VTE event in children is about $27,000, so the, the financial cost and the length of stay, too. And then the risk. Well, if, if VTE is a hospital-acquired condition, what about bleeding in the face of prophylaxis? That feels like an iatrogenic uh, complication. Uh, you know, do we do something that makes them bleed, uh, and how do we manage that? What about pain? There's a lot of emphasis on patient experience these days. Are you going to give shots once or twice a day to children, 10,000 children, to keep three of them from getting a VTE? I don't think that's unimportant, but it should be said uh, as well. And then monitoring. I think the approach to this in adult trauma care is very much a one-size-fits-all sort of dosing, set it and forget it sort of thing. 
Uh, but we take care of patients who are different sizes and ages. Do we need to monitor anti-factor 10A levels if we're going to do this? And what's the cost and morbidity of that? And then again, and we'll look at some slides in a minute, how well does this work in children? Uh, we assume it works, uh, maybe the same way it does in adults, but, but we don't have the data uh, to really go with that assumption. Uh, so we're going to look at several risk factors and then move on to, uh, to effectiveness, and then what do we do? So what about age? This study came out in 2013 in uh, um, JAMA Surgery, looking at the National Trauma Database at, at children ages 0 to 21. So the 21-year-old children were included in this uh, study as well. The overall incidence was about 0.4 percent, but that number is very much backloaded towards the older patients, uh, some would say adults. Uh, and, and I think what you can take from a study like this has to be you know, couched in all the provisos that I mentioned before, there is an age-related risk that goes with this, and it's not uh, that there is a start point and end point. So the title of this study was, When Do Children Become Adults? And I don't know that we can really answer that. But somewhere around 13, it looks like the risk starts to creep up. And then you see a big shoulder at age 16, and whether that's purely physiology and development, or if there's something about pediatric and adult care, um, how hard you look for these things, if if somebody gets short of breath in an adult hospital, do they get a CTA? And if that same patient gets short of breath in a children's hospital, do you do that? Do you uh, manage the risk differently? And does that change how often you'll find these things? So the study doesn't answer that. But I think we're going to see this shape of a graph on several other slides as well, that there is something about the adolescent years uh, that isn't binary, uh, but it's a gradual risk as you get older. Uh, and what about other risk factors? I won't belabor this, but these are... Um, uh, commonly uh, embraced uh, risk factors for developing a VTE, central venous catheter, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, pelvis fracture, major lower extremity fracture, vascular injury, uh, mu multiple injuries, polytrauma, severe trauma, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and the list goes on and on. These are risk factors that are seen in adult trauma care and that are replicated in pediatric trauma care. But there's a difference between saying that somebody has a risk for VTE and saying you should do prophylaxis for that. Those are two related but still distinct questions. Uh, this uh, slide, I uh, apologize in a way that, that it's small, but I wanted everybody in the audience to have access to it. This paper just came out a couple months ago from the group at Oregon, uh, looking at not just what are risk factors, but how much risk does each of these things buy. So they, again, use the National Trauma Database, looking at over 500,000 patients, and they tested the model against a separate data set from that same larger data set. And they looked at 10 factors. They came up with a model that was fairly parsimonious in terms of looking at uh, GCS, age, uh, sex, intubation, PICU admission, transfusion, central venous catheter placement, pelvis fracture, lower extremity fracture, major surgery. Uh, that, uh, and then they assigned point values to the uh, existence of each of these risk factors and generated a nomogram that would say, can we predict what a what a child's risk is based on the presence of these factors. So not just saying pelvis fracture is a risk factor, but how much risk does a pelvis fracture get you? Uh, and you can see on the graph to the right on the screen there, they drew some lines. So a score of about 524, uh, by adding up these factors, got a risk of 1%. And a score of 688 uh, then got you a risk of 5%. And the authors sort of called these sort of low, intermediate, and high risk. Uh, but I think that point is contentious in its own way. But this is a great paper in terms of how do I make a more informed decision about understanding these risks. I think this is as good a paper as any about um, putting those things together uh, to guide how you view the care of an individual patient. Uh, so how are we doing with this? Uh, are, are the same patients with the same risk being treated the same way? And the answer is no. So this is a survey uh, that was done through the Journal of Trauma Nursing uh, where they called for and received 133 practice management guidelines from different institutions and asked simple questions of those guidelines. What age do you start doing VTE prophylaxis? And you could see that there were very few at the 12-year-old age and about 100% at the 20-year-old age, but there was uh, this gradation uh, going from adolescence all the way up about whether or not they would do prophylaxis for these patients. And that's also reflected in, well, what prophylaxis did you use? The, the white bars are mechanical prophylaxis, SCDs. The black bars are pharmacologic prophylaxis. And heaven forbid, the gray bars are IVC filters. So, uh, so we, as uh, trauma centers, are not of one voice for what we're doing to try to prevent this from happening. Uh, this is more recent data gathered through the Pediatric Trauma Society. So even among sort of uh, pediatric-minded places, we're still not 
all playing from the same sheet of music. What risk factors do these centers use? Well, some things like spinal cord injury had a very high rate of um, incorporation into risk management guidelines, uh, but that wasn't um, seen with other factors uh, like the presence of major surgery, which in the Oregon paper was a huge contributor to risk. So even among pediatric-minded folks, we're not seeing the same problem in the same way. Uh, and then getting to the question of does prophylaxis work at all? So even if we were to apply this the same way at every center in the world, uh, how well would it work? So the top graph is looking at pediatric trauma. So this looks at over the last decade or so, the use of anoxaparin, low molecular weight heparin. And, uh, and we can see that over the last decade or so, that use uh, has increased. This is from the, the FIS database. So there's an increased use of anoxaparin in pediatric trauma patients, but there is not a corresponding decrease in the rate of VTE. So this, uh, this data shouldn't be used to conclude too much, but I would say by its absence, we don't see, uh, or this, this data doesn't make the case that prophylaxis is highly effective at preventing this from happening. Um, and I won't say too much more about that. So what else do we know from, from the care of children? Well, there's another group that's also at high risk for VTE, and that's cancer patients who have central venous catheters in as part of their chemotherapy treatment. Well, there have been three prospective randomized controlled trials looking at can we reduce the incidence of, of VTE in these patients using different things, low molecular weight heparin, antithrombin concentrate, and low dose warfarin. And none of those three studies were able to demonstrate a benefit to prophylaxis. So we assume that prophylaxis will keep our patients from getting PEs and DVTs, but there's a little bit of we just assume it. We don't have the data to say for sure that that works. Uh, these, power, these studies may have been underpowered, and the authors acknowledge that, but it gives pause from just carrying the adult assumption to the pediatric world that this is what we should be doing because we know it works. Uh, finally, I've got, an, uh, well, another graph that has a lot of small writing on it, but this is the one study uh, that shows a benefit to prophylaxis in pediatric trauma. There is one study, and that's this one from the group up at Milwaukee. The reason I think it's important to have that graph or that graphic on there is that's the protocol that they use. So I would say if you're looking for how should we do what we do at our center, this is perhaps the most evidence-based model, and it's based on one paper that's a case control study. Uh, what the group did there was they looked at their own incidence of VTE in the PICU population. So these were only patients that were admitted to the ICU. Um, they then uh, developed a practice management guideline where they char characterized the patient's VTE risk and their bleeding risk. So patients who were high risk of VTE but low risk of bleeding got treated with mechanical prophylaxis and pharmacologic prophylaxis. Patients that were at high risk of VTE and high risk of bleeding got mechanical prophylaxis only. And then if they were still in the ICU on day seven, they got an ultrasound. Patients that were low risk for VTE didn't get pharmacologic prophylaxis. And what they found was that uh, when they incorporated this guideline, they saw a reduction in these patients from 5.2% 5 5 down to 1.8%. So this is the best study that we have that shows that there um, may be a benefit to VTE prophylaxis in preventing VTE in injured children. But this is a case control study. The author authors acknowledged that there was a non-significant trend uh, towards younger age and less severe injury in the sort of after guidelines uh, group. So there are some confounders here too, uh, but that's the best paper that's out there. So in the absence of data, what do you reach for? Well, in the absence of data, we're left with consensus. I don't know, Rich, what do you do? I don't know, David, what do you do? You know, we kind of compare notes and try to decide, are we all in the same camp or are we going in different directions? So this is a way to sort of organize that version of data. This was done through the Pediatric Trauma Society. It's been accepted for publication in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, so watch for that next summer. Uh, but we used the modified Delphi method, identifying experts uh, who are either peer-nominated or self-identified in the field of VTE for children. And we asked about things like age, ambulation, risk factors, bleeding, mechanical prophylaxis, and the use of screening ultrasound. Uh, and we had a multidisciplinary group. I think that's one of the strong uh, points of this study was that we, it wasn't just a bunch of pediatric surgeons comparing notes about how pediatric surgeons think about this, but we had pediatric hematologists, critical care physicians, even some neurosurgeons, trauma, adult trauma surgeons, and uh, pharmacists represented as well uh, to sort of form this expert consensus panel. Uh, this is a graph that it's colorful and you can dig deep in it if you want. This is looking at risk factors, and I think the, the point of this slide is just to show that even among experts, there is not agreement about are these things risk factors? 
And the question that came to our panel is, are these risk factors that you would do prophylaxis for? Not just are they risk factors for developing BTE, but would you pull the trigger on pharmacologic prophylaxis in children who have uh, this panel of risk factors? Uh, so our panel did, uh, as we worked through the process, come up with five things that reached consensus. So this is, I think, the best that we have currently for expert opinion. One, children less than 12 years old, generally speaking, do not need routine VTE prophylaxis. Our panel agreed with that at the greater than 80 percent level. The second point of agreement was that mechanical prophylaxis uh, is appropriate for children who are at risk for VTE, but un or inappropriate for pharmacologic prophylaxis. So there's not a lot of data about SCDs in children, but there is a sense of agreement that there is some value if you can't safely give pharmacologic prophylaxis. Ambulation alone is not sufficiently protective, our panel agreed. So children who are ambulating may also need prophylaxis based on other risk factors. Um, there was a sense of a patient who has a personal history of VTE should uh, uh, receive prophylaxis, um, and a weak recommendation that patients with a central venous catheter in place should also receive VTE prophylaxis. So these were five areas where our panel agreed, and then there were 11 areas of near consensus, so 70 to 79 percent agreement on the following things, and I'll try not to just sort of read the laundry list, but that screening ultrasound uh, in general does not have much value. Uh, pelvis fracture, spinal cord injury, obesity, vascular injury, uh, severe injury severity, um, family history and oral contraceptive use were felt uh, at the near consensus level to be significant risks. Um, we tried to get our panel to, um, to agree on how long should you hold it in patients that uh, need their prophylaxis held. And we, we didn't get to consensus, so I'll have to suspend judgment on it. But at least for these things, there was near consensus for holding it for three days after a neuros neurosurgical operation, uh, holding it for four days after intracranial hemorrhage, and three days after a major solid organ injury. One of the most vexing things about this question is that many of the risk factors for developing VTE are also risk factors for bleeding. So uh, we'd like this to be clear and easy, but it is an implicitly and inherently complicated question because um, you can see how a patient that needs prophylaxis is also at risk for bleeding by trying to prevent the clot. So what did we conclude? Well, this was the punchline question that we should have asked our expert panel, but, but didn't. So injured children should receive par pharmacologic VTE prophylaxis. Uh, never, always, or it depends. The, the answer is always, it depends, right? We, we, uh, there are so many interactions that go into these decisions that to really boil it down to just one or two things, um, I, I think is perhaps uh, wishful thinking. So what can you take home from this? Um, uh, these are the things that I would conclude, and this is sort of the gospel according to John Petty, not necessarily the Pediatric Trauma Society or Rochelle Cohen or anyone else. Uh, but I think we can say with pretty good confidence that the risk is real, but the risk is also small. And that, uh, that makes it a hard question to answer, but it's something to be thankful for. I think when we look at age, you know, we'd love to say it's 13, it's 15, it's 18. Um, but there is a sort of a continuous uh, protective effect from age. You know, we when we went to our expert panel, we tried to get an age at which you should start prophylaxis. So we found that for 12 and under, most people agree that you shouldn't routinely prophylax. But our panelists, our experts, were all over the map for what age you should. Uh, so some said 13, some said 15, some said 21, and some said 18. And we really couldn't get consensus on an age at which you start. So we think that 12 and under, you probably don't have to start. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you should start at 13. Although I would recommend doing a risk assessment at age 13. I think as we look at that graph start to take off at 13, I think that's a valuable age to start asking the question, uh, even though I don't think that the, a 13-year-old's risk is the same as an 18-year-old's risk. I don't think there's, uh, there's good evidence to support the use of routine screening ultrasound. I think you uh, would look through a lot of haystacks to try to find the needle, and there's uh, cost associated with that. Uh, I think that there was a general sense of cautious prophylaxis in patients with bleeding risk. Again, risk factors for clotting are also injuries that can be associated with bleeding. So I think uh, to, to be too extreme at one end or the other is probably missing the complexity of it. But I think exercising caution is appropriate. Um, one thing I would encourage everybody in the room and in the, uh, the watching audience is to have a care pathway. There's variability in this. And you can pick one that has one or two things, but that is probably better than not having one at all. There is tremendous variability in terms of how we understand this. But to the extent that similar patients with similar risks are treated similarly, we can only expect outcomes to be better.
I think there's also uh, value in modifying the modifiable risk factors. So what is that? Well, early ambulation, I think we can all get behind uh, walking our patients sooner if that's um, something that their injuries don't prevent. I think it also um, makes us uh, ask the question about central venous catheters. Do they need them? And the th is this patient a patient that really needs it? And if a patient has one, how soon can we get it out? I think central venous catheter is a potentially modifiable risk factor. And I think there's enough sort of confusion and pooled ignorance on this question to say what we really need is a national trial to randomize patients and answer the question in a proper way. That may be also wishful thinking, uh, but I think uh, there is enough uh, confusion about the right thing to do on this kind of question to say uh, the only way that we'll answer it for a rare event is to combine our patients and treat them all the same way. So uh, I'll throw out a few discussion questions for uh, those online and certainly would welcome questions from the folks in the room and, uh, and at home. So actually, uh, while you're throwing those up there, I'd like to invite all the faculty, if you're still with us, to go ahead and turn on your cameras so we can conclude here with answers to these questions and anyone else. Sorry, go ahead. So just a general invitation, I mean, if we can, uh, you know, get every center to sort of represent what they do. Do you have a protocol uh, for PT prophylaxis in children? And then what age do you start uh, incorporating that? Uh, and if you have, have a moment for that, what are the most important risk factors that you use at your place to uh, drive that? I think it would be worth uh, sort of seeing what people do. All right. Thanks, John. That was great. Um, it gave us a lot to, a lot to think about. I, I will start by saying um, we have a protocol, but we're pretty variable in its use. Um, we don't think about um, prophylaxis as much as we probably should. Part of that goes to all that variability in the data um, that you showed us. And part of that goes to what you said about the high-risk patients are also the high-risk group uh, for bleeding. So our neurosurgeons don't really want us giving prophylactic, you know, Lovenox early. Um, but they're also the high-risk group that's bedridden, staying in bed. So I think it's, there's, this helps focus. And I think your point of having a guideline versus no guideline is definitely uh, a valid and important point. So I'd open it up to the rest of the, the faculty that have been on um, to at least go through and comment, what do you have a protocol and what age do you use? Um, yeah. So uh, we do have a protocol. Um, it's, um, so it's based on the number of risk factors and by age. I think it starts at age 10. Um, and, um, you know, age is a risk factor and then, um, all the things that, um, uh, uh, that, uh, that you included in the talk were, were really, you know, um, you know, part of our guidelines part, they were written by, uh, by Craig Egan who trained at Milwaukee. And so it looks surprisingly similar <laughs> to, uh, to what you showed us. Thanks. Um. So I don't know if there are any online questions or I know we're running we're yes. running behind on the time. But so actually, you know, since we dispersed the questions throughout instead of at the end, we're actually going to be to the minute on time. Great. Um, so this will be an opportunity for anyone out there to ask questions that weren't answered. Um, and uh, uh, while, while that's coming up here, we did repost that link to go to get your CME credit for this. Um, and uh, the archive of this will be available uh, shortly after. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Fenton there. Do you, I don't know if you were able to hear the, the last tail part about DVT prophylaxis. Do you guys have a protocol there? Yeah, we do. I, I, I was able to hear it. Uh, we, we start ours at um, 13 years of age and older. And um, we use mechanical and or Lovenox and kind of run into the same issues with the neurosurgeons. Although I will have to say, our neurosurgeons are, are rather aggressive. Um, by 24 or 48 hours, uh, a lot of times they're giving us permis permission, even in kids with intracranial hemorrhage, to start um, uh, anticoagulation on them, prophylactic anticoagulation. That's great, Steve. I would just throw one comment out. I didn't put slides about it. I, I think we, we fear Lovenox maybe more than we should. I, I think there is pretty good evidence that, that the bleeding risk is low on that medication somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.4%. So uh, we're afraid of it, and we would feel terrible if somebody bled on it. But the actual incidence of that is pretty low. So I, I think as, as the adult data maybe gets more developed, we might see a little bit more uh, friendliness towards using it and using it earlier. That's great. I, I just want to take a moment to, to thank Globalcast and the team that's helped make today and Todd um, make today 
I think, successful from, from our end and from the comments that seemed uh, successful from those of you out here who have stayed, stayed with us and, and participated. Um, I'd like to, again, thank Children's Institute for helping to sponsor this along with Cincinnati Children's. Um, and you've heard throughout the, the day, Pediatric Trauma Society, and I'll put in a final plug for those of you who are interested enough to join us. We hope you're interested enough to look into joining the Pediatric Trauma Society as well. How does um, someone go about joining the Pediatric Trauma Society? Um, all you need to do is go to the pediatrictraumasociety.org, and there's a, a sign-up link there. It doesn't, you don't have to be a surgeon. You don't have to be a physician. Um, you just have to be interested in pediatric trauma care. So if you're on the line here, you're probably you're, you're qualified to be a member. Actually, I did want to say one thing. Jenny, thank you for reminding me. Uh, Rich uh, did a, a great podcast uh, where, and I'm hoping you'll do more because uh, it's hard to cover all of trauma in, in, in an hour, but it was basically uh, asking pointed questions with three to five minute answers on the very most controversial topics. And already, like I said, that's changed my management. And we actually refer to it every time in our trauma conference. Well, according to Rich Falcone and the podcast, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show a little uh, video on how, uh, uh, what it looks like, but actually um, maybe we'll even put a link on how to download the app and you can listen to it and hopefully you'll do more of those. So uh, fantastic event. As always, I want to thank Cincinnati Children's for putting these events on all the time on every topic of pediatric surgery. Thank you for the, to the Children's Institute for always sponsoring these trauma events and hopefully we'll have many more of these. So to everyone out there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much.